see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes, Sukumar, we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So this is the this is the corporate storytelling technique that I can say I developed over so many years, maybe if not decades. So I'm going to cover that to you with you. It can be the same thing we use for teaching how to make pitches for your projects, business case, everything. So I like to start my sessions usually with an inspirational video. So I'm going to start with a quick 30 second video. Let's hope the technology cooperates with us and we can see this one. In just 30 seconds, please watch. Can you hear the sound? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. We yeah can. Yes, yes. Volkswagen. Just for the dad, I want to buy a Volkswagen. <laughs> okay, well, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, it was spotted by one of my colleagues, Sanjay Radha Krishnan. I love this ad. So, it's my story surprising. starts. Sorry? It's not surprising. Volkswagen <laughs> comes out with some. Sorry, uh, Kartike. So Volkswagen comes with amazing ads. I've seen it over 20 years. Or oh, they are, they bring one of the best set of ads, uh, you know, yeah, for in this uh, segment here. Mm. Agree. Yes. Vijay, you are saying something? No, I was just trying to say something funny. It's not surprising given the fact that Hitler promoted this car a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Okay, interesting. It was his, it was his favorite company. <laughs> I see. Okay. So my story starts with this NASCOM Innovation Awards. Um, I thought Kumar was going to be here, but uh, from the innovation group. So Vijay certainly knows about this. So NASCOM Innovation Awards, Feb 2012. In that year, some of you that are ex-cognizant, you know this, right? The uh, We were trying to win this Innovation Awards. Somehow, Whitey, who used to lead the innovation group, had set this as one of the agenda items. So every year we used to compete. And we had competed four times prior to this. We reached the finals and we lose. This was the fifth time. And it so happened this fifth time that uh, the innovation from Cognizant was one Cognizant, which I was leading as the CIO. I was also the head of innovation. So obviously the team requested me to make the presentation. I planned for it meticulously. We had a designer from Kuchin create this fancy slides. I usually put together my own slides which don't look half as good or even quarter as good, but we had that, we prepared everything. I rehearsed it to death. In fact, the I had many of my direct reports uh, in the room from Cognizant uh, IT department and from uh, innovation, there were a few people as well. So I make uh, the presentation. So what happened was, <laughs> what can I say? Um, it's one of the worst presentations I've ever done. It's like an epic disaster. One of the executives was like this throat. It's the who's who of the IT industry in the jury members, right? You know that. So one guy was like this. One person will ask me some question which will throw me off my script. Needless to say, complete disaster. I mean, even now when I think about it, I shudder. On my way back, I mean, I was so frustrated. I thought I blew uh, the golden chance for Cognizant. But my teammates were very kind. Right? So they came up with this um, 
thing that NASCOM itself is jinxed. Because this is the fifth time we attempted and we lost. So they felt that uh, this thing itself, there is a jinx. Maybe that was just to satisfy me. They said that. But it was clear to me that uh, I didn't tell a good story. I was already a practitioner of storytelling techniques even then. Right? I used to study storytelling. I used to try to teach this to people. I thought I used the storytelling technique or I maybe I didn't. So I blew it. Now why I know that uh, that presentation was a problem is because later on, actually here Vijay Ram Bhatla is here. I am eternally grateful to him because we were so frustrated. He came and said, hey, why don't we apply? Why should we just look for NASCOM award? Why don't we apply for the CIO 100 awards? So and made, he actually wrote the nomination. I mean, you wouldn't let me go without applying. I was not big on these awards and things. So we applied and we got it. So we got so many awards that we could not keep count of for one cognizant. So clearly that presentation was a problem. So let's see, this is how the journey starts. So I start to go a little bit into the technique itself. And I, the way this, my presentations generally work, for those of you that are not familiar is, I keep asking questions and at least one or two of you have to answer in the chat box. You can also unmute and tell me. But tell me what is the difference between these two items on the screen? Uh, is it content and articulation? Content and articulation could be. Uh, tangible versus uh, abstract. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Thanks. So it is abstract versus concrete. Right? So weight is concrete and intelligence is abstract. So you can think of them as some things that you can measure and some things that you can't measure, like you said, intangible versus tangible. That's also a good uh, way to think about it. Now, one of the mistakes I found, I made this too. I continue to make this and it's a common mistake that we all make. We tend to make in the corporate very abstract presentations. And through my work in Tiny Magic, I've also been studying the subconscious. The subconscious cannot latch on to abstract concepts that easily. But it can <clears> latch <throat> on to concrete things much more easily. For example, if I told you adaptability, what exactly is it, right? Things start running in your head, so it, 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 the, the subconscious cannot bite into it quickly. So this is the first mistake we make. We tend to be abstract and not concrete. So when you start, for example, this presentation that I did, is this abstract or concrete? This NASCOM thing I talked about. Looks pretty concrete to me. Yeah, it's concrete, right? Because I'm talking about a specific experience that I had. So I could have started with how important storytelling is things like that so it's it's starting with concrete is important and there is more examples now what about emotions are they abstract or concrete abstract okay others that's an abstract. abstract. <clears throat> I think it manifests as concrete, but uh, the concept is uh, uh, abstract. Okay, so let me give you an example. I told you, right, I was very frustrated. I, after this epic failure, I'm telling you the emotions I'm going through. Is that abstract or concrete? That is concrete. 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 Ah, Exactly. So I am not very sure whether emotions are abstract or concrete, but emotions connect with you. Depending on right. the emotion I'm describing, you might be also able to relate to it. 
right? So sometimes emotions can be abstract. Sometimes I find emotions are when they are relatable, they become concrete. So think of it that way. It's somewhat of a trick question. So this whole theory, which you can go through later, I'm not going to cover it. It's called the ladder of abstraction. So basically there is no limit on how abstract you can get. You can start all the way from the street, uh, seeds, roots, to all the way to a planet, a universe, and you can keep on going. So we tend to be starting above this watermark, generally. Whereas what is concrete is what catches the attention. This is not my theory. This is Hiyakawa's theory that you can read later. Right? This book is actually online. It's free of charge. Uh, you can download it and read it if you are curious how this thing works. So this abstract to concrete is the latest thing I added. Typically, proper, there are three typical problems in corporate presentations. Can some of you tell me any problems that you notice in the corporate presentations that you have attended? We talk too much about ourselves. OK. Too much about ourselves. Shanti says attention. I don't know what that means. And the slides become, you know, too full, you know, with a lot of ah. extent. Whatever we want ah. to say, it will be in the slide. Ah, correct. Very nice. Yeah. Too much information. Yes. Vijay lacks emotion. Yes. Yeah. Attention, what did you mean by that, Shanti? Yeah, so uh, what I meant was the attention span of the audience. So many people want to understand what it is in a few seconds. Ah, correct. Okay. Okay, so we'll go on. More or less there. But one thing that I noticed, which I have made, I'm going to tell you where I made this mistake. We take too much time to get started in the name of this context setting. Yeah, Ganesh, information overload is correct. It's almost an epidemic in corporate. Somebody will come in and say, hey, let me set the context. <laughs> sure. Okay, and you're gone. Okay, so now uh, Shanti mentioned this attention span. So how much time does you do you think your subconscious gives the speaker before it decides to listen? Remember, this is a subconscious process. Physically, you may be there in the room nodding your head, but your subconscious seconds. may be in la-la land. 30 seconds. Oh, about 90 seconds? 30 Th seconds. 30 is yeah. yeah, correct. Too much context didn't create curiosity. Yeah, I, I'll come to that. So the point is this, right? Within 20 to 30 seconds, you have to say something that catches the attention of the subconscious brain of the audience, which is what actually decides whether you should pay attention or not. Like I said, you may be physically present and nodding your head and smiling and whatever gestures you typically give, but uh, your subconscious may be switched off. So don't do this context setting at all, right? We'll come to this. Now, the epic mistake I made in my <laughs> disastrous mass comp presentation was that I was talking first about how Cognizant spent. I was so proud about how the innovation group finds the top five innovations in Cognizant to submit it to NASCOM. That was my first slide. <laughs> I think back and I am now thinking how ridiculous, right? Obviously, <coughs> I lost the audience right there. They are expecting me to talk about one Cognizant. I am talking about how the innovation group spotted this one cognizant innovation completely needless second i think all of you covered this too much information in our slides we packed almost everything we want to say into the slides and the third thing is too much text which i think um, the audience loses confidence in us if we are making a presentation we are not very sure about it. yeah sure the thing I would say is if you want, if you have to do context setting, probably you have the wrong audience. So you have not understood the audience or whatever. There's some problem. So you can't do context setting. That's where you lose the audience. Okay, next time you hear the word 
i am going to do contact setting by anybody including yourself just observe what happens in the room and you will know what i mean now coming back to the dascom disastrous presentation is i told you that i was already a practitioner of uh, storytelling and many of my colleagues know this in cognition what i realized is that storytelling is not just a technique it's actually a mindset and you cannot change mindset using a very complicated you won't be able to practice a very complicated storytelling technique there are many of in fact i used to teach my friend uh, rs prasanna some of you know him the bollywood director i used to bring him and he used to teach a storytelling technique which is quite impressive and quite good but then it did not lend itself for us to be able to practice it in every presentation we would make so the thing that i would like you all to do is that that use this technique always every time you are speaking or making a presentation use this technique and it is so simple that you will be able to do it i will cover the technique itself but simplicity of the method and this is true of almost any new soft skill you are picking up you need a starting point for any skill so you can learn the most complicated way and i teach disruptive innovation and there are like i can teach you a method that will for you to learn will take you 10 days there's no way on earth you're going to apply that in a meaningful fashion after learning something for 10 days so you should be able to learn something quickly in 1 minute 2 minutes and you should be able to apply that is the kind of technique we look for in tiny magic and we developed this through our practice inspired by many other storytelling teachers and i use i went back to the drawing board and picked the most basic simplest story right the story of the thirsty crow which i think all of you know can somebody humor me and narrate the story of the thirsty crow <coughs> please quickly Okay. Come on, people. So All the, of you know this. Yeah. Let 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 let's go. So the thirsty. The, there was a crow that was thirsty. It uh, chanced upon a pot of water. Obviously, the water wasn't up to the brim. So the crow was uh, intelligent enough to throw in stones inside the pot to make the water come up, and it was able to drink and quench its thirst. And then, one important thing happens in storytelling. Yes, that's correct, Bala. You got most of it. There's one more keyword at the end of the story that you have to say. Uh, clueless. The crow flew away happily. Ah, okay. Right. Or they happily lived ever after. So that 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 ending state is important, right? You want a happy right. ending. Got so it. i analyzed the story right so i analyzed the story and i came up with first a three part technique you can think of the first character p h a so there is the problem right the problem is the crow found the water but it can't reach like bala so and it comes up with the brilliant idea of putting the pebbles or stones it raises the water it drinks the water quenches the thirst which is achievement and flies away happy now the the three part technique in storytelling is very famous right everybody has got a three part technique shakespeare had a three act play beginning middle end you hear this three part structure over and over if ever you ever attended any storytelling session so this psa is nothing nothing unusual in that way right the usual you can say but then i realized that there is something sticky about this story this story that for those of you that are not familiar about the authorship this was written by a greek writer by name esop he wrote many such tales involving animals much like our panchatantra and jataka tales right so this is 2000 plus years old 
imagine that even after 2000 years we're still talking about the story and i think for the next 2000 years we'll still be talking about it so what makes the story sticky is what i got into my head and i was thinking about it so let's go back into the problems in the so this technique right we call is upsa you can memorize that we will come to that psa is obvious what is this u we are going to cover later so in this upsa technique the first thing you do is instead of context setting you start with the problem itself right don't say for example like i said i could have started this session with how important storytelling is and i used to do that i will first explain the importance of and i have lose the audience right there instead i start with my problem the nascom jinx the disastrous presentation that i made hopefully that brought your subconscious at, uh, mind into the attention otherwise you might have tuned out i don't know that's what i have seen routinely happens when you don't start with something concrete and the problem has got to be concrete if you marry this with a concrete versus abstract that's where you need to start and many experts will tell you you have to start with a hook which is why most people start with a joke or something like that but i would advocate starting directly with what is the problem and we are in corporate right it's very easy to say what the problem is when you start and try to describe the problem in a way that it catches your audience's attention the second problem is the tricky one right there is just too much information now i looked at the slides from the world's greatest companies it's all available luckily on the internet they all look like this this second one is my own when i used to be in the retail practice of cogs this 3d offerings i don't know what i was thinking what the, what is the audience supposed to do but this is what we created at that time we are thinking that many fancy full slides with a lot of information is is good unfortunately it doesn't work like that now if you look at what is the corporate audience wanting from people and again this is a subconscious that we had to research and figure this out anybody sitting through a corporate presentation they want inspiration or insight or learning this is what any corporate audience is looking for how many presentations of ours do you think delivers on that and give me a percentage one out of 10 2 out of 10 like that how many times you go attend a corporate presentation and you get one of these how many times out of 10 one at best one at best does anybody have a different answer one vijay says one yeah one is being actually gracious because one out of 10 would be 10% <laughs> so it'll be like <laughs> it'll be like one out of 100 yeah one if lucky yeah correct so you all agree with me right so that's what is happening yep. so imagine the key expectation from a presentation we are not delivering so let's go ahead a guy by name carmine gallo i don't know if you have all come across this person he wrote this book called talk like ted right he analyzed the world's most viewed ted 100 ted talks of all time between them there are billions of page views he identified three components to your presentation one is your credibility why should i listen to you facts and data and the third is emotions so you analyze them and put percentages on all of them, all the three of them can you all make a guess what are the percentage distributions between these three uh one third each one third each okay that's a good guess <clears throat> anybody else i would say uh 30 Uh, i'm going from top to bottom so about uh, yeah 20 20 15 and 65 emotion 65 emotion wow very good vijay majority is emotion shanti says 40 20 40 yeah i think ravi and vijay very good guess venkat also very good guess 75% very nice 
So this is the actual split. 10, 25, 65. Now, let's go back to the corporate presentation. How much emotion is there in our corporate presentation, typically? Pretty much zero. Yeah. Pretty um, much zero. Yeah. In fact, if you're lucky, so we have been told in corporate that emotion is a bad thing. Please be professional. Don't get emotional. See, we, are, we associate using emotions as a lack of professionalism. So the very thing that connects with people, we don't use. This is the tragedy of the corporate presentation. So we have a real problem. The one thing that, now why is this important is because we are emotional beings and we make our decisions using our emotions and then justify it through the rational. Yeah, Venkat, you're right. Uh, litigation and all that. But I think there is, see, I think we are, uh, we don't understand the power of emotions. Let me put it that way. Yes, the lawyering up and all that uh, is there. <coughs> but I think we don't need to go that far. Simple emotions could be used. Anyway, so this metaphor is from the book Switch. I don't know if many of you have read it. It's a brilliant book on change management. So the rational part is the rider and the elephant is the emotional part. So we are not, by not using emotions, we are not engaging the elephant, which is why most of our presentations fall flat. Okay, so now we have, we have a tall order. I need to deliver inspiration, insight, learning, and emotion in a presentation. This seems like pretty hard to do, right? How do you do that in every presentation? Yeah, one important presentation I can do, but doing this in every presentation, I don't see how. Perhaps people see through you if you're authentic. I mean, yeah, see, the point is, uh, we don't, dis for example, the presentation that I started with, right, this NASCOM disastrous presentation. I doubt any executive will come out and talk about that type of experience. So, I'm not saying I'm great or anything, but I'm saying over the years, I found that that type of Content connects with people because, like you say, Shanti is authentic and it it connects with people. Anyway, we'll move ahead from here. So I was researching this. Yeah, exactly. Emotion is perceived as a weakness. Exactly. That is the issue. Now, depending on what emotion you explain, now through Brinny Brown's work and many other people's work, vulnerability is a very important thing now. Right? Vulnerability is something that you, if you display, it makes it authentic. Anyway, we'll go ahead from this. Yeah, passion again. See, yes, if you speak passionately, people can pick up on it. But that is sign of inferred. I'm saying directly, I don't come out and say, look, I am very sad today. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I don't include emotions in my picture at all. Yeah. I may be indirectly communicating some emotion through my body language or passion, but where is the, why aren't we not communicating? Why are we so afraid or whatever, right? We have kind of uh, ironed out the very thing that connects with people. Anyway, we'll see. So the aha moment I had was this thing that, this is from Claude Shannon's information theory. So I converted that into a metaphor. And this is my famous metaphor, and you can remember this. A lot of people say that they find this very easy to remember what I'm talking about. Yeah, Brenny Brown's book on vulnerability, correct. It's called Daring Greatly. You can read that. It's, it's a kind of a hard-to-read book, but it is pretty, pretty uh, insight. So let me tell you this, right? Tomorrow, I'm going to say to all of you, tomorrow morning, the sun will rise in the east in whichever city you are in. I'm making a corporate presentation. What will you say to me? So what's new? So what's new, right? You already know that. Whether I said it or not, the sun will rise in the east. But instead, if I told you, God forbid, there's going to be an earthquake in your neighborhood tomorrow. 
Now, if I had that information, you would pay me money to receive that information. It is so valuable because in most cities that we live in, the probability of an earthquake is very, very low. So if I had that information, I could literally print money. So think of information on a spectrum. On one side, you have sunrises in the east type of information. On the other side, you have earthquake in your neighborhood type of information. Now, in a typical corporate presentation, in which side of the spectrum your slides belong to? Obviously, the or side, the information yeah. you're speaking. Sorry, mo most, m most of the uh, the cred part is pretty much the sun because we keep talking about ourselves and why we are great. Most of the fact part is also not new to pretty much everyone. Uh, so most of the information is towards the sun, yeah. Correct. We mostly fill our, well, that's why our slides also look, because we want to communicate everything about everything, which is mostly sunrises in the east information. Now let's build on this metaphor a little bit. Let's say I go to Japan and then I say, make a presentation. Sir, madam, tomorrow there will be an earthquake in your neighborhood. What will the Japanese people say? So what? So what? Oh, they already knew that. Because earthquakes keep happening and they plan for it. Their buildings are designed for it and all of that. So whether something <coughs> is sunrise east or earthquake is based on the audience. This is what the point I want to make. So I have sat through many presentations and I used to make these presentations also. Five people on site, 50 people offshore. Right, this type of presentation we used to make. And I, I over a period of time, I observe all our delivery managers say something like, to that effect. And once I had this insight, unless you are saying one person on site and 20,000 people offshore, there is no impact there is, right? Everybody is working in an on site offshore model. So there is really no earthquake type information there, but we continue to fill our presentations with that type of information. So this is important, right? And judge from the audience. So what is unusual? So I call this unusual, okay? What is unusual to you, the earthquake, may or may not be unusual to the audience. So it has to be judged from what is unusual. Definitely no earthquake, maybe a curious news in Japan. Yeah, correct. Good one, Vijay. So this is uh, Claude Shannon's information theory. Unexpected infrequent events yield a lot more information than frequent ones. Now that's a mouthful and it's very hard to understand what that is. So I use this meta. So I developed this thing called, I call this Shannon story filter. So whatever facts and things you have in your presentation, put it through the filter. And pick only the unusual ones. Judge the unusualness from the audience perspective. Now, this unusual can also be cumulative, right? I will give you some examples of that. So in the Cognizant uh, Innovation Program, even though every, every innovation is a little $5,000, $10,000, cumulatively, we delivered a billion dollars in 2030. So each innovation by itself may not be remarkable, but as a community, we delivered $1 billion. So that makes people take note. Toyota, 20 million ideas implemented in 40 years. Many companies will be lucky if they generated 20 million ideas, but Toyota has implemented 20 million ideas in 40 years. A remarkable statistic. And my own fitness journey, I've completed once. If I told you that I can do 60 push-ups at one go every day, you will be like, yeah, I, I do 30, I can do 60. But if I tell you 175,000 push-ups over 10 years, 11 years, you, you have to sit up and take note of it. Because it's not that easy to do it every day over that long a period of time. So you can also use this unusual aspect. Even though what you do in the corporate, many other times we do what's seemingly mundane and it is hard to extract the unusual out of it. And you can do cumulatively unusual. For example, if you are a delivery leader, you can say, I, instead of saying I have 20 years experience, you can say I have delivered $200 million worth of projects so far. Something like that could catch people's attention. 
So the next, the last part of the problem is there is just too much text, right? What can we do? So we obviously we know we have to go visual. So I'm going to give you some techniques and also my colleague, Dr. Anbarasu Tangavelu has actually developed a very simple technique on how to beautify slides. I will send you all a link and you can go through his material and learn how to put together. In fact, these slides have been created by Dr. Ram. That's why they look that good. So tell me between these two things, obviously the fruit apple was recognized by your mind very quickly. Can any of you guess how much faster is the brain recognizing the one on the left versus the one on the right? Any guesses? 80%. 80%, okay. That is, it's 80% faster. Yes. Okay. Venkat says 4x, okay. Much faster, definitely. How much faster is the question, Vijay? Orders of magnitude. But that will be 1x, Ravi. Oh, when could no, no, I, I'm it? saying like you, know, you recognize it in a in a milli millisecond. Before ah, you correct. Get yeah, Apple also you might have recognized in a few milliseconds. So oh. tell me how much is the speed difference? When app, so Apple, Apple is a, fruit, a very uh, familiar perhaps fruit. in millisecond. Yeah, but then Apple can be in the context of uh, you know fruit company Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve Apple you know can be in milli context there. So. I think that 100 true, times Karthik, or 1000 you times. You recognize it's... the word apple in your brain, right? How much time it takes. So the meaning of the word apple will come to next. Understood. It's probably okay. about two seconds, but then apple picture seems to be like milliseconds. Okay. So let's see what the answer is. It is 60,000 X faster. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't know this. So... Uh, the best guess here was 4x from Venkat. So it, we are remiss if we are not using visuals. That's the point of this particular slide. And if you use a very powerful visual, it gets very, very impactful. So now we are going to the next part of the visuals. I'm going to tell you this is Samsung, okay? 7900 mAh, quick charge. What is the sense you make out of this? What is 7,900 mAh? Battery capacity. Yeah, correct. But what do you, what do you, what is, what does that mean to you? Yes, it's battery capacity. It's, it's milliampere hours mAh. So what are they trying to communicate through the 7,900? Uh, probably long, long lasting, uh, you know, phone life, essentially. And the Correct. visual probably indicates four days of charge. Yeah, something like that, right? Very good. So look at what the master storyteller, how does he communicate the same thing? <coughs> this is, this appeared in the keynote of Steve Jobs when he launched iPad. He said, you can fly all the way from Narito to San Francisco, which is 10 hours. Actually, San Francisco to Narita is what he said. You can keep on watching videos and the charge will still be there at the end of the flight. Now, which one is more relatable? Right? It's obvious <laughs> this is not relatable at all, but this is. Right? This is the brilliance of Steve Jobs and this is an example of the power of metaphor. And there is more mm. examples I can give you. I'm going to give you one. Now think about the Volkswagen ad that we did in the beginning. It was like less than 30 seconds, right? So what did they, what did they use? What is the metaphor they use? Any of you remember? Uh, good over evil. Yeah, good over evil was the meta, but how did they communicate that so quickly? Uh, Ram Ramayana. 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 <clears throat> Correct. Ramayana is something all of us know in India, at least. In some parts of other parts of the world also. But in India, most people will know that. So I don't have to explain Rama, Ravana, all of that. So the context, see, metaphors 
eliminate the need for you to i have sort of started thinking of metaphors as a wormhole between two minds this is the fastest way to connect to somebody if i use a good metaphor i can connect with you in like millisecond now it is not easy to choose the correct metaphor but if you can do that this is the fastest it's like my grandmother used to say it's like lighting a piece of camphor right the karpuram in tamil we call it it gets lit instantly you will be able to do that if you use a metaphor if you use an appropriate metaphor you can you can do this so what are the metaphors that i've used so far can any of you list i use several metaphors already <laughs> camphor is not for the just way. use right now Camp for Sorry? Ramayana and Narita to San Francisco not counted, please. Yeah, exactly. Wormhole to the receiver's mind. Yeah, that's good, <laughs> Ravi. But think back from the beginning, beginning of my presentation, where I started. Oh, uh, Aesop's fable slash uh, the crow drinking water. Ah, uh, crow is a thirsty crow is a metaphor. Okay, in the interest of time, on the NASCAR uh, thing, inspiration right, from movies. Did you notice something? Yeah, yeah, sour grapes. Inspiration uh, from movies. Sour, sour grapes, grapes exactly. There. You picked that up, Bala. Very nice. So sour grapes. That's also another Aesop story, actually. So thirsty crow is a metaphor, but I gave you another important metaphor that I wanted all of you to remember, which is the sunrise east versus earthquake. That's a metaphor. uh from the switch book right the elephant and the rider that's a metaphor so there are many metaphors that i have used which is what hopefully makes some of this material stick with you the same idea as explained beautifully in the star trek where will we find this episode venkat Netflix. Okay, very nice. I'll look look for it. Thank you very much. So you're all got the power of metaphors, right? Now, <clears throat> what is the best way to identify metaphors today? That is in 2024. What is the best way to do this? I, I would hate Thank to say that. Thank you, Venkat, for the reference. It is Chat GPT. I know that's why, why I hate to hear that you're pretty. It is so brilliant that it is unbelievable. Okay, so I am going to show you an example. What is this trying to communicate? An energy drink. You know, look no. carefully. Look at the fruit that is in the hands of the person. lemon. Making lime from uh, making lemonade from. Lemon. No, no. When when life gives you a lem lemon, make a lemonade. Brilliant, exactly. So I communicated all that to you with a picture that is generated out of Dali. So today you will it is so then so actually how I came across this was I teach something called as responsibility mode versus fault mode mindset. I didn't teach that here. so I, i i was trying to explain that and i found recently i did mostly usually people understand that concept because it's fairly easy but recently i came across a bunch of executives who refused to understand that concept and they were arguing with me so i went to chat gpt and asked hey can you suggest me a metaphor like a 5 year old and it came up with this <laughs> when life gives you lemons make lemonade out of it so then i asked dali okay please generate that as an image and it gave me this <laughs> excuse me so first it generated the image on the left then i said okay generate one more with the woman in it so it created this uh, second one so i can be so that it does have gender bias and many other biases so you have to be 
careful when you're asking it to generate pictures. It mostly generates men, usually white colored people, all of that. So anyway, so the best way to find a metaphor for whatever you're communicating, which was very hard in the past, is now a five minute job. You give it the concept, chat GPT will tell you what metaphor to use. And the same chat GPT will also generate a nice image for you. And I've been using this technique in my presentations a lot these days. Just so you can also try them. <clears throat> so I have to tell you uh, one humorous incident. Okay, so uh, in my early days after I quit Cognizant, right? So I, I mean, some colleagues of our people, our Cognizant colleagues who went uh, well elsewhere, they remember me as a good storyteller. So they call me and say, hey, can you do the storytelling session? So I went to Hyderabad one day and I was making a presentation. So I had arrived the previous night itself. Typically, that's what I do to avoid any flight delays in the actual day of the event, right? So I had some time on my hands. So I went to the website of this company. I found a case study there. So I took that case study and I showed in the in the session how to convert it into a story. All was fine until the guy who actually wrote that case study on the website was in the class, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> so he started arguing with me about, oh, I was, like, I was like, there was like 40 people in the class and he was arguing with me about how the storytelling couldn't be done kind of thing. I realized that I made a huge mistake. So finally, I was figuring out a way to try to wriggle out of it. So I, then I asked him, sir, uh, how did you create this? Uh, how, what template did you use to create these slides on the website? He said, the marketing department game. I said, see, it's the marketing department's fault, not yours. <laughs> so somehow I wriggled out of that situation. But after that, I realized I can use my own presentations. I have made so many horrible presentations. Like this NASCOM Jinx is, is a famous one, but I have done many such. So here is one more. So I no longer use anybody else's presentations, but I use my own to illustrate the point. So this is an analytics portal project that we were bidding on Cognizant and I was presenting. This was my first executive summary slide. There's only a poor quality screenshot of it available. Okay, so I will tell you the reason later why and if there is time. So tell me what is wrong with this picture. <laughs> Karthik, yeah, that's good. Ten heads indicating the space, yeah. As well as the middle seat seat belt, right, which many cars don't have. So they plug some Correct. of the features and all. Very nice. Good observation. So tell me what is wrong with this slide. Connect it back to what I have taught you all so far. It's abstract. It's not concrete. Yes. It's abstract. Correct. But there's one crucial mistake I'm making. Uh, no visuals. Correct. No visuals. But there is a bigger mistake I'm making. You can compensate for lack of visuals, lack of anything, if you use this one thing. So usually... Uh... Ah, Venkat got it. I think Purnima, you are also saying that. There is no unusual. See, all of this is Sunrise East. If your analytics portal didn't do any of this, that would be news. So what should I have done? I should have said, sir, ma'am, thank you for the opportunity. Here are the three things we are doing differently in our proposal. Yes, we have covered all the requirements you have asked for in your RFP. We have actually have a traceability matrix at the end of it. But let me take you through the three differentiating elements of our proposal, and I should have focused on that. So there it is text, no visual, no concrete. But the main problem is there is no unusual. 
so finally i am almost done with the towards the end of the presentation so i get another chance for an ascom presentation right this time it is 2013 early 2013 for those of you that know this is uh, satish satish jayaraman in cognizance hr department so he was bidding on an ascom hr tech award right so he said he called me and said hey we have reached the finals you have to make the presentation i said sadish do you know that there is a nascom jinx <laughs> if i make the presentation we will lose right i tried to tell him that and he would have none of it he said it doesn't matter even if we lose only you have to make the presentation okay fine so i have to go for this this time it happens in bangalore again the who is who of the it industry is there myself sadish arthi srinath George Woman, right? The four of us enter the room, ready to make the presentation, and they say, "Sorry, we have only ten minutes. We are running behind time. You don't have your twenty minutes. There's only ten minutes." So the Nascom Jinx was doing the dance in my head. I was like, "Shit, maybe this Nascom Jinx is really correct, right?" So I'm thinking, but then I breeze through the presentation in ten minutes. and can you all guess what might have happened did we win or not yeah <laughs> santi correct so obviously we won right this is uh, the nascom jinx right there is no nascom jinx it's just the way we are uh, this what do you call it rationalizing the performance to ourselves so we won the award myself arthi satish george we went up the podium proudly collected in fact they kindly gave me the award to keep it with me so it's somewhere in my house in one of my displays so that's how that ended so you can see the upsa in this presentation it's we use the same technique that it is trying to teach is the problem unusual i mean the that we all make bad presentation there is nothing unusual in that per se but a cxo coming and talking about their disastrous presentation is not routine typically people won't do that so that way it is unusual the solution i believe the upsa technique is unusual you might not have heard of this technique most likely because this technique was developed by us it doesn't exist in this fashion in the internet the nascom jinx con which is the achievement that's nothing we have all won many awards so there is nothing unusual per se in that so it follows the upsa format <clears throat> so our recommendation is the unusual is the proxy for inspiration emotion insight and learning and i would recommend that you have at least one of it unusual in the thirsty cross case what was unusual was it the problem or the solution or the achievement the solution the solution right it's brilliant yes. the crow uh, coming up with this idea now we know crows are actually very very intelligent it's yes. unlikely he stop knew that or maybe he intuitively figured that out so the solution was brilliant and that alone has made the story stick for the last 2000 years and it will stick for 2000 more years and you will also notice another thing in the thirsty crow esop doesn't describe there is this bird called crow it has gray in color typically it has beak two legs nothing there is a thirsty crow even though he is addressing it to children he chose crows and not falcons or eagles or anything so that he doesn't have to do that context setting so there is no context setting there is the thirsty crow it starts straight away with the problem so it is a home run in many ways so if you are able to get all the three unusual i believe that you will get a viral story you would have hit the equivalent of the storytelling jackpot if you can get all the three unusual but even if one is unusual you will still be able to impact the audience So UPSA is the name of the technique, and you can start practicing that. So there is also a generative AI agent that we have developed. Let me see if I can show you that. So 
so we have developed uh, uh, this generative ai based agents for many of the things we teach so this corporate storytelling right it can you can click this you can say if you tell me the story it will tell you 